not going for diving. Uh, I'm going to jump off the end of the wharf when we're done here. You good. <laughs> oh, I noticed at least you want to run through them. <laughs> with your, I don't arm, know, with your arms up. I know there's a more wetsuit. <laughs> I brought, yeah, I brought my wetsuit so I can film you guys from the water from the perspective. That's free the board. Yeah. I'm going to paddleboard, but I'm not going to get wet. What are you going to get down here now? I see the flags blowing in the breeze, so it's definitely a little goofy. Awesome. I brought my fishing pole. How about an ice cream? Where do you want to end up? Look at that candy. Well, let's just go out towards the end. Leave far out of the top of the world. This is a Benali. There's a the kid. The we'll knock out the hard oh. right. Oh gosh. I want a little bit of outdoor. privacy. I guess so. There's one boat over there. Welcome to the Ruddle Show. I'm Lisette, and this is my dad, the Ruddle. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing really great. We're out here. I think we got up about five and we got down here really early, big 10 minute drive. We're out here on the end of the wharf. This is the oldest wharf in the state of California and on the entire West Coast, Canada and Mexico. We thought it would be really neat to start our fifth season to get out of the studio and to get to kind of like a special inspirational location <laughs> to launch the new season. So here we are and it's early. I've had a lot of coffee, but I don't feel it yet. <laughs> Well, you know what? We have to our east, looking out to the east, we have a sunrise. That's where the sun would come up. And it would be coming right out of the water. And uh, we have fog today, but look, it's, it's breaking. You see behind us the, the colors, just only the ridge of the mesa, and the birds out there on the sand spit, and back along the old wharf. Yep. And you know what? We came out here to maybe do a little fishing. Yeah, we're out here with the fishermen this morning. And you might be wondering why we didn't choose a sunny day to come out here for a sunrise. But that's because in Santa Barbara in May, there isn't very there aren't very many sunny mornings because we have what we call May Gray. And next month we'll have June Bloom. So we just thought we'd come out here in the fog. <laughs> and if the fog swirls, it shrouds our season ahead. And it's not clear what we're gonna do exactly, only we know. <laughs> We have some guests, so we're excited about that, and we're, you know, some new topics, some new segments that we've thought of, so we're excited about it. What have you been doing in the off-season? I've been working on that trifecta project, and we're going to have several clips across all ten shows, probably, <laughs> having little uh, things. The progress little, checks. Yeah, little, little moments of truth, right? <laughs> okay, well, we have a great show, and... Um, we're going to get started on that in a second. But I would recommend, you know, in your location that you get out to some special spot for a sunrise because it's a great way to start the day and it's a great way to start the rest of your life. And for us, it's a great way to start season five. So, so let's get inspired here, okay? We'll see you on the set soon. We were just at the beach, but I had something happen to me on the way to the studio, and I got blocked by traffic, which reminds me of my topic today, block canals. Now, if you talk to most dentists, and even endodontists, about blocks, they'll immediately think it's the inability to slide a small stainless steel hand file to length. But we must understand there's lateral blocks just as well, and they're more insidious. We don't see them, and then we don't get to capture the lateral anatomy 
on our post-operative films. So today we're going to talk about lateral and apical blocks. It's quite an enigma. In fact, I've written several chapters in international textbooks on endodontic retreatment, and I would say one of the most common event that we see in non-surgical retreatment is the enigma of the block canal. So let's talk a little bit about how they occur, and then we'll talk about their prevention and management. How about that? Okay, so this case is a pretty nice root canal about 95% of the way, but there's that little problem right there, and we didn't see the colleague necessarily show obturation material to length. So John West, when he was a resident at Boston University, Goldman School of Graduate Dentistry under Herb Schilder, that was back in the 70s, he did a master thesis on this, and what he showed was he showed by extracting teeth and using uh, Pelican ink, he could uh, use a centrifuge and he could stain the teeth that were failing and he could find out what part of the root canal system was not addressed. These two slides have nothing uh, to do with each other. This is what we see clinically in practice all the time. John West just showed us what it might look like. So what do you think this is right there? This right there, that dark area, that is the fatal flaw in endodontics. That's dentine mud. So we got to talk today about its production and its management. But you can see where the dye went in, there were multiple portals of exit. So clinically, you might say, well, we're two millimeters short. I just made that up. It might be one and a half millimeter short. But you can see to be in this analogy, two millimeters short, you might miss another millimeter and another millimeter and a half. You might miss maybe four or five millimeters of root canal system. And we'd all start to say then that's too short. We can't be that short cliff. So think about laterally and vertically, not just uh, as the x-ray sometimes shows us in the vertical extent. Okay, so we now see that we can find these clinically. We kind of can see a histological section showing kind of what happens and so the gutta percha dies out against that block. And then back to another case. I'm gonna show this next week because we're gonna talk about how to manage other things. But uh, again, this is the posterior abutment of a bridge and it's pretty good endodontics. Uh, I don't necessarily like post in the mesial roots, maybe if it's a passive fiber post, but not metal. And then of course we're short again. And of course there's breakdown and now we have a lesion of endodontic origin and then what to do, what to do about that. So we see this all the time. So whenever I see a filling material short radiographically and the patient's having symptoms or the lesions getting bigger where there was no lesion, I'm immediately thinking uh, probably a block canal. Let's look at the block canal. So you get your access cut, right? And then you take usually your first hand file, might be a stainless steel tin and you start working that file in. And there's two problems we have that I'm going to identify today. We have mechanical problems and we have anatomical problems. When you put those two together, it's synergistic. It's one plus one is three. So colleagues have been trained for decades to work short of the radiographic terminus. I said radiographic terminus, not radiographic apex, anatomic apex, okay? So by colleagues working short, they are making mud, they see it in their file, but they probably don't notice that it's getting pushed into space. So as you begin to make a little space, not only is the mud on the flutes of your file, but it's also getting pushed into eccentricities off the rounder part of canals. So always think laterally. And then of course, we gotta remember that when we go from the 10 to the 15 file, which colleagues do effortlessly, and they have bought into this, that every file, is bigger by 05 between 10 and 60. So between 10 and 60, all files get bigger at their tips by 05, 05, 05. So when you go from 10 to 15, the difference is five, five over 10 is 50%. So they don't realize that the 15 file is 50% bigger than the 10 file that preceded. That incidentally is the biggest jump in dentistry. So grinding that 15 in really compacts this, really starts to pack it in tight. Now we have, we've gone from a nuisance block to now we have a serious block going on. And the colleague's really happy because everything's going fine 
and we usually go through a little bit more chair time and we go through a few more instruments, manual or mechanical, doesn't matter if it's a concept, blocks can happen either way. So we go through a few more instruments and remember most colleagues over the decades were trained to get about a 30, 35 or 40 to length. So by the time you grind those bigger instruments to length, the files begin to generate mud the mud begins to stack up. It actually pushes the larger file up and out of the canal. And you might have wanted to work one millimeter short, conscientiously. Oftentimes when you're fitting your cone, you're two to three millimeters short. And if I were seeing your faces, you would all be nodding. We've all had the case where we deliberately and intentionally worked a little bit short. We thought that was the standard of care, working a half or one. Who you are is where you were when, what school did you go to, who was your mentor, that's how short you were. And because of that, those bigger files get pushed out and now you're even shorter than was your intention. So now you got a serious, serious block and these can be sometimes addressed non-surgically, but then the patient has another procedure. Let's get back to the anatomy. We were all taught to work to the cemental dental junction. That was considered the ideal vertical extent of treatment, endodontic treatment. But we gotta remember this blue demarcation is uh, to depict cementum. Cementum covers the dentin. It comes through the anatomical foramen and moves up through the canal and it ascends coronally. Listen carefully. It is uneven. It can ascend up a few microns or several millimeters. So when they taught us to work to the CDJ, they were just kidding. You know, it's not possible. Only a histologist at a workbench can identify the CDJ. A clinician can't. We have electronic apex locators. That's really helped us get closer to length on a consistent basis. Schilder made it really easy. He said, just work to the radiographic terminus. The radiographic terminus would be right there. Even if the file is minutely long, every canal is importantly catheterized. And when you catheterize a canal, now your reagents can go out into tens of thousands, millions of dental tubules, lateral canals when present. So you have the ability then to address more anatomy. So to come back to our lateral and apical block, you can see clearly the apical block. Radiographically, you would just see your file short. And if you went to try to advance it, it wouldn't go, but you probably never even considered that unless you had one of these asymmetrical lesions where you're already starting to map out the egress of irritants out of the root canal space is gonna cause bone loss. And if we see asymmetrical lesions, you might map it out in your mind that there should be something there. But of course, when you pack, you probably see nothing because you have a block. So, work the files, the smallest, most flexible files to the RT to keep the foramen open. Said another way, keep the foramen. Say it. Now say it again. And now what are we gonna do when we don't know what to do? We're gonna maintain patency. We're gonna be patent. That's the prescription. So one thing you can do immediately if you inherit a block canal, even if it's your own, is do a little body work and get the canal open coronally. I like to use the SX to do that and the ProTaper family of instruments. SX can immediately create space. And of course, I wrote about 25, 50 pages. I wrote 50 pages about this in Pathways of the Pulp, Edition 8. This was Chapter 8, Chapter 8 in Edition 8. And uh, we talked about all these little tricks, but pre-enlargement gives you quite a few advantages. You can actually, the, moment, the only thing I'll talk about here is you can actually pre-curve a 10 file. You can pass the pre-curve 10 file through the pre-enlarged canal and the file will arrive curved apically when you get to curvature. If you have this all packed up with dentin, canyons of narrow dentin, then when you put a curve on an instrument, uh, canyons of restrictive dentin, knock the curve off the instrument, and the instrument arrives apically pretty straight. It's gonna dig into the outer wall. And now we're gonna have another segment about ledge management. So that's next time, another time. So you can do a lot of really neat things with pre-enlargement. So that's a trick in block management. 
So let's move on. Let's look at our tools. We don't have very expensive tools here. You're going to love this part because it's, it's bread and butter, basic, simple stuff. So what are the tools? You need probably only one hand file. And I'll just put in here for fun. You might have an 06 and you might have an 08 uh, available. But I find these in block management too skinny, too fragile. Cross-sectional diameters too thin, too skinny and they're gonna crimple, roll over, and collapse. So you need a little bit more rigidity, and that can be the 10 file. I'm not gonna today talk about uh, C-Pilot files and uh, double tapered 10 files, the old fours, because a lot of times, yeah, they're stiffer, but they're bigger, and we don't need bigger. We need to pierce through mud with a very delicate little instrument to break up the debris, get it into solution, so we can flush it out of the tooth. So. Probably just need three hand files. Uh, Tin's the one I typically use. Now, we have viscous chelators, and by Ruddle's definition, a viscous chelator is ethylene diamine tetracetic acid in a methylcellulose suspension. So that means that we can get RC prep, glide, prolube, those are all in the family of what I just spoke about. This is offloaded into a throwaway single-use syringe and we'll square it right in the tooth. Two things to consider. I have less experience with Kemet. John West likes it. He wrote an article, I think, in 2005 in Dentistry Day about it. And it is a succimer of EDTA. So I'm thinking it's in the same family, but he likes it and he thinks it's a little bit more powerful. That's another little trick for you. That's readily available. The next one is not readily available. I'll see if I can pronounce this uh, 15 letters in this. Uh, it's trichloroacetic acid, trichloroacetic acid. And TCA is none other than another form of a chelator and it is not available, but it will be coming soon to market. And we're gonna have Dr. Terry Panka tell us more about that. He's got a whole library of beautiful cases and he swears by early negotiation when things are tough, when it's vital, when you have collagenous tissue, you can get shrinkage of the tissue. And then by shrinking the tissue, you make space for your file to slide into. So in any event, you're gonna be using something and probably it's right here, it's readily available, it's inexpensive, and it's a chelating agent. It's gonna help you get through the mud. So let's now look at, we've looked at the anatomy a little bit and what some of the problems are there. In other words, not understanding the CBJ and thinking it's a, a, a perpendicular relationship to the long axis of the canal and really it's a scallop. North wall is different than south wall, east wall, west wall. Uh, invasion of cementum in an irregular way through that anatomical foramen. When you look at these files, we're talking isophiles. They want all manufacturers to make sort of the same files. So we don't buy a file from one company that's different from another company. So all tens at the diameter at D0, the tip of the file, is a 10, a 15, a 20. You know that. If you go up millimeter by millimeter, two, three, four, up to D16, that's the diameter of 16, then all files have a taper of 32 hundredths of a millimeter over the 16 millimeters. If you have 32 to 10, if you have 32 to 15 and 32 to 20, you get the D16 diameter. So chair side, you can begin to appreciate when you got a 10 file in your hand, you can make significantly more space than the number on the handle says because it's almost a 42 at D16. And even if you only have so much of it below the orifice, you're probably at a 35. You're making quite a bit of space. So that's a good thing. All right, so what else should we know about these files? Starts to look like we could have a formula. So every file tapers two hundredths of a millimeter. It gets bigger by two hundredths of a millimeter Every one millimeter, we go up the file. So it's a 10, a 12, a 14, a 16. And if we do that 16 times during a 10, we'll be at 42. Said another way, if you divide 16 into 0 0.32,
bring the point up and you're gonna have O2. And if you move it over, because it's a percent, these are 2%. So that's how you get to 2%. You might've known that. Okay. So how do we use these ideas that we just talked about? I would do a little pre-enlargement. You can see we've done that. I would put viscous chelator into the tooth with a syringe. That'll give me slip and slide. It'll start to uh, take down collagen and prevent its readherence. It's sticky, it's collagenous, it's the glue. And what are in these blocks? You know, I, I better come back and talk about it. Could it just be all pulp tissue, a pulp stump? Will that pulp stump stay vital over the life of the patient? Oh gee, I don't know. Then why don't we take it out? Why are we guessing? This is a patient here we're working on. Okay, so could it be uh, necrotic tissue? Oh yeah, it could be necrotic tissue. Could it be a combination of vital and necrotic tissue and maybe some bacteria? So it's usually a cocktail of junk. And that's why we should never allow a pulp stump to be resident in the tooth post endodontics. That's not endodontics, that's flirting with endodontics. I want you to be more than you are and closer to all you can be. So back to the story, just slide in with a pre-curve 10, try to start doing a little reconnaissance, pre-curve it a little bit, slide down passively and just bump into it. You'll feel it, a little block, just bump it, tap it a little bit gently. Pull back, rebutter the flutes of your 10, slide back in, drag more viscous chelator deeper. Just touch it, touch it, touch it. Maybe touch it 10, 15 times. If nothing's really happening after 10, 15, 20, 30 times, literally, then I want you to get a little bit more aggressive. Um, it's a pretty tight block. It's not a nuisance block. You would have already broke through. It's a serious block. So now I want you to use short vertical amplitude strokes and it's like pick, 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 pick. And I'll put a brand new straight 10 in. A lot of times it's not even pre-curved now because it's not a nuisance, it's a serious block. And if I'm in a root that's curved, if I'm in a root that's curved, when I pull this file out after 10 or 15 of those little pecks, I'm looking to see is the file a straight line? If it's a straight line, I'm on my way to what? First a ledge, and then if I really keep working hard, a perforation will result. Oh, that's great, now I can do something else. Remember, we're looking for things to do. Um, okay, I guess we talk about that in the next section. Uh, where, which discipline are we in and which shoe do we wear and all that stuff. But if you put the file in straight and you're picking and you pull it out, you wipe the chelator off the file, Ruddle sees a little curve in the file. That means Ruddle's tracking, I'm not making. Make the distinction. I'm following an anatomical pathway versus iatrogenically creating a false pathway. So you just have to what? Have some time, get comfortable, tell your staff to quit bothering you because that's what's gonna cave you in. That's gonna be the difference for you between success and failure is probably your staff. And if that happens, that's your fault. Because you got to tell them, no distractions. This is not a time to be asking me anything. And if you have time and you're patient, if you're patient, good things happen. I could almost always get through any blocked canal. And remember, that was 90% of my practice was non-surgical and surgical retreatment of other people's failures. And blocked canals were ubiquitous. They were everywhere on short fills. So you gotta say, I'm the guy that's gonna get through it. Remember, if you think you can, you can. And if you think you can't, you're right. So pick, 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 pick. And you'll feel that instrument start to engage. It'll get sticky. Then you could drop to an eight because now you start to have a little pathway. You just need a little smaller instrument and you could even drop to a six. But I want you to catheterize the canal. Hey baby, to and through is magic. And remember the 10 file, if this is a 10 file, the 10 file is only a 10 file at D0 and at D1 it's a 12. So we've already transitioned to a 12 and now we're going from a 12 to a 15. The difference is three 12s, three 12s. See what we just did? 
we knocked off the 50% change and we made it a 25% change if we just use a patency file. Again, say patency, spell patency, write patency. Okay, so patency is great. One last comment, when you get through, don't take the file out. I can see a lot of you right now. Oh great, we made it. You leap up to go do a hygiene check in another room. <laughs> You'll probably never get back. When you get there, hang out and work that file like I'm gonna show you right here. So squirt some of this in. Grab your tin file. This is a case that was referred in. Had to take out gutta percha and had to do a lot of little things to clean up. But now we're down to the last two millimeters of the game. The game's about little things that make the big difference. So here's a sliding through passively and some little pecks, some little touches, some little, uh, hello, how are you? I'm a file. What are you? Are you mud? Are you putrescent? Are you stinky? Are you a bacterium? Okay. But you'll see that little stick, you'll feel it, and you can slide. Stop doing this. You always want to turn the screw clockwise to advance it into the wall. If it's a wooden wall, it's a screw. This is in the Danics. Sliding is much more effective than screwing. And then do this. In, out, in, out, in, out. You do this until the file is loose, until you can put your nose on the file and push the file to length. Wes says super loose. Now you're checking your glide path. Take a stroke out, two strokes, three strokes. I like to pull the file back about a stop, about two stops, and then about three stops. If that file is slipping and sliding, start to say the word slip, slide. Oh, I love these words. And glide, slip, slide, and glide. Then you not only have a glide path, you own the glide path, and now your mechanical files will follow. They need to follow a confirmed, reproducible slide path, a patent canal. All right, so once you get there, hang out, Work it in little strokes. You'll feel all starting to get easier, looser. And now you'll start to go, I can now take it out because I can find it again and put the next file in. So we work to the radiographic terminus. I know if we extract this tooth, I want you to know that I know if we extract the tooth, Ruddle's going to see two instruments sticking through. That's patency, baby. You do not want to work arbitrarily short in vital or necrotic cases. So that's working right to the RT. The reason you want to work to the RT is because you want your reagents to exchange and then you can fit a cone. You're going to get on this with heat and pressure and carry a wave of thermal soften, gutta perch and sealer into the apical third. Our shape confines our reagents to stay in the tooth. Hey, gentle wave, you might think about a little shaping now and then. And then at least, at least deep shape, huh? And then, you know, you can pack it down, pack that cone down, out with the lateral anatomy, boom! There's the post-op. Now, in this post-op, you've seen this case before, but this is really a hallmark case to show the importance of patency, because you'll pick up about eight portals of exit, eight POEs, and here you got bifidity in the third one, three POEs, eight portals of exit. That's endodontics, okay? And I saw on the AA discussion, they're going, oh gosh, he's using a laser. The results are looking like Hess, Hess type. We've been getting lateral canals for the last 35, 40, 50, 60 years. Talk to the guys in the shielder generation. They were doing it in the 50s and the 60s. So filling lateral canals is not a new, uh, a newfound skill. Uh, it's having some ideas, inexpensive ideas. You can do this very, very inexpensively and have lasting results. Lateral blocks. Okay. Well, you know, when you load up that file and you pull it out, you go, oh, better clean the flutes. The file's really dirty. Better clean the canal. How about that? So after every single file is removed, what do you think Ruddle does? Use the endo activator. It's inexpensive. Each Delrin, that's a you know, like a nylon type tip. Each Delrin, it's a polymer, is non-cutting. 
it works in the pulp chamber. You can see all the bubbles in your mouth mirror. What you can't see and what you'd love to see is what's going on below the orifice. So we've made simulated canals. You can exceed the exchange and that exchange of reagent can go into all corners of the root canal system. And basically bubbles are formed because liquids are fractured with a polymer tip and bubbles form that are unstable because of heat and pressure. They expand and boom, they get deep into the tubules. They work into lateral anatomy. And look at this, three orifices all in about the last two millimeters. This is why we don't want to work short. Working short arbitrarily means we're going to miss a lot of anatomy. Because if you're working short, this is all going to be mud. This is all going to be mud. And you're going to basically see something that is very boring and ends right here. So, lateral blocks, you see a lot in retreatment. You see these lesions form laterally. There's probably a lesion apically. We can all see that. You get a CBCT, you have to be an overt lesion. But the more overt one that we see in a two-dimensional radiograph is laterally. You can see that that silver point has broken down. Ions, precipitate ions, have leached through a lateral canal or more, and it's caused osteolytic activity in a LEO. So get that out, that's another prescription. Here's the sinus tract tracing with the gutta percha cone, but I want you to see the tattoo. The tattoo is not a melanoma, it's not a cancer, it's secondary to endodontic failure. So the prescription on the napkin is, uh, we'll talk about retreatment in more detail, but we got the shape. We wanna keep the shape as small as we can. The case just needs to really be clean, not really shaped. And then, of course, you can see down packing and out with that lateral canal, back packing, post-op, and then about 15 years later, you, you can see how well the bone has adjusted and adapted to complete endonics. Remember, uh, endonics is a regenerated procedure. It's not a clean shape pack procedure. That's what it is, but it invites the patient to grow bone. So that's a lateral block endo activator have a couple ideas you can pick up the endo activator between every file you can do it at the close of treatment for disinfection you can do solvents mta you can vibrate calcium hydroxide in big discussion form oh you know calcium hydroxide can't be pushed through the frame quit pushing it how about vibrating it we're just about done but you know, you just keep seeing this over and over and over. That's done by an endodontist in LA. They pride themselves in a 40 minute molar, 40 minute molars that look like that. That guy should be probably uh, put out to pasture where he can have lots of martinis and really enjoy the short world of his vision. Because there's ramifications. There's two separate distinct and unrelated problems. We have thermal sensitivity and we have pressure sensitivity. So we went after both of them but look at what you're gonna see in the last two millimeters, just in the last two millimeters. Probably missed five millimeters of root canal system. You can see MB1 and two, they're spiraling over each other, two separate portals of exit. Look at how corkscrew that DB is. And a little anatomy there and a portal of exit there and endodonics should be three dimensional. It should be fun. And I think we can close pretty much on, this one is a real strategic tooth. The more strategic and the more critical dentistry you do for your patients, I'm talking about that dentistry that's going to be heavily restored, the finances, the time, the investment's going to be massive. We can't do endo like that. That's the Paolo root. There's no buckle roots. This is a big splint. So I didn't do any of this endodontics, but the I sent the patient back to the Beverly Hills dentist to take the splint off, and you're seeing a little temp bond there, but we got to tap that off. And once we get that tapped off, we have all the fun of getting, not only it was filled to about right here, but we get the bifidity, we get the loop, we get the lateral canal that's just to the base of the infrabony pocket. And we did the anterior abutment. And I think you would have met even 25, 30 years ago, that's conservative endodontics. Look at the amount of remaining cervical dentin Everybody should be happy in the MI world, the MIE world. Oh, they should be so happy. So I want to close it down with this. Glide path management is the secret to success. He who owns the glide path wins the inner game of endodontics. Best wishes, and as they say in Italy, 
Che vediamo all'apache. See you at the apex. Okay, so we have a new segment to debut for you today, and it's called Whose Job Is It? For the most part, dentistry has some pretty well-defined disciplines where clinicians focus on procedures specific to that area of knowledge. However, it isn't always so clear cut because general dentists tend to do a little bit of everything. For example, a general dentist might do root canals or they might even do more complex restorative work. Um, further, there are some procedures like implants that don't easily fall into a specific discipline. So in, the, in recent years, which discipline has mostly taken charge of implants? Well, from the inception many decades ago, uh, everybody kind of started doing them. Primarily, it was first oral surgeons because it was a little bit intimidating to be putting fixtures in the bone. And then uh, oral surgeons don't have a lot of continuity with patient follow-up care. So sometimes the implants were not placed in alignment for proper restorative. So periodontists who see patients forever, they never finish cases. That's the joke in the profession. They like recalls. They understand restorative dentistry. They work hand in glove with restorative dentists, so they start placing implants. And of course, general dentists, the ones that were well-trained, uh, they took classes and they started doing it. But there isn't any recognized specialty area of implantology. Uh, the ADA doesn't recognize it as a specialty area. So to your point, there's been, I don't know if it's been a turf war, but there's been different groups at different times. Some well-trained endodontists started doing them and a lot of them stopped. So right now I would say in Santa Barbara, it's the periodontist and the oral surgeons that do the, the dominant amount. We still have a few cowboys that put them in everywhere. Okay, I know that in our first season, way back in the beginning of 2020, we did a show where we discussed the implants versus endodontics option and a little bit of controversy surrounding that issue. And at that time, we also mentioned that the ADA didn't recognize a specific discipline in charge of implants. So what has influenced like what is what I'm trying to ask is how has it become that oral surgeons have sort of taken it on knowledge training experience okay do you want to say um well well maybe technology you have in your office as well well yeah knowledge means you know they've taken classes they probably had some failures you learn more uh, way more from your failures than you ever learn from your successes so that would be knowledge and experience and then uh when i had my implants placed in uh, locally by an oral surgeon in town he used xnav and i was very impressed with that because that was a departure from the old sleeve guides and all the laboratory work and getting things lined up and fixtures I mean, he just did it live and he was watching on a screen and it controls the depth, the angulation, and uh, it, it guides you right into proper alignment so you don't uh, hit anatomical structures so that the restorative dentist, you know, this is all interdisciplinary treatment. It's got to be planned with the general dentist because they're the quarterback and they know the bridge they're going to place, the casting they're going to place. So they want that implant in a very optimal position and they would communicate that. And most of them have a very nice relationship with the oral surgeons or the periodontist. Okay, so for implants, um, since the ADA doesn't recognize a specialty that is in charge of implants, then it's kind of evolved into like who has the technology, who's doing it all the time, um, so they have experience. So, the, so it's kind of fallen to, you said, um, what did you say, periodontists and oral surgeons? They're doing most of them in Santa Barbara. We have a few general dentists and probably there's a, a closet in the dentist that might do them occasionally. Mm -hmm. But uh, most of it has been given up because uh, there was a famous endodontist that one time said in front of 1,200 people at the American Association of Endodontic Annual Meeting, uh, come on, you guys, start putting in implants. Any monkey can drill a hole in the bone. Well, that didn't go over very big in the profession because putting the hole in the bone to receive the fixture is the easiest part of it with all the technology. So there's got to be a lot of understanding about flap design, sinus lifts, um, you know, load management, occlusal interference, work balance. 
uh, all this has to come to the forefront to have success. So, and then of course there's the kind of fixtures. Some fixtures are just like Indyke files. Some are better, some are worse. So with time, all this is sorted out over the last three decades and, and pretty much in Santa Barbara to be redundant, it's periodontist or oral surgeons. Okay, so if you were a patient, I would actually want to be, the, if I was getting an implant, I would want to go to somebody who's doing a lot of implants, who has this XNAV in their office. And um, I understand it's interdisciplinary. You probably work with other um, disciplines of dentistry to get this done, but it seems that um, really it's technology and knowledge and experience mm -hmm. that determines it. So this brings us now to... Maybe passion, desire. I mean... Maybe you're really busy extracting teeth and you think, you know, I'd like to give people more teeth to bite on. Maybe you decide that's more benevolent. So, yeah, a lot of it depends on your your motivations, your inspirations, your desire. Okay, so now let's move on to another topic that has come up recently regarding who should be performing the restorative work following endodontic treatment. And recently the AAE published their newsletter and in it dr richard schwartz wrote an article where he suggested that endodontists maybe perform some of the initial restorative work um before returning them to the general dentist mm -hmm. and he says this because the literature seems to suggest that immediate restoration reduces the chances of failure every time well after reading that article, the president of the AGD, Dr. Bruce Cassis, was very concerned after he read the article and um, wrote a letter to the AAE. So why was Dr. Cassis so concerned? Well, first, we need to investigate Dr. Bruce Cassis to find out if that's his opinion or did so many general dentists in the AGD come to him with such grave concerns that they said, you know, defend us, protect our profession, protect our discipline. We These guys are getting out of their lanes and we got to make sure, you know, we rebut. I don't know if he really would have a problem, but it sounded like coming from his pen on paper on the rebuttal point counterpoint, it sounded like he was pretty concerned. My impression was he was concerned that he felt like endodontists might be overstepping, um, you know, their their boundaries or not staying in their lane, I think you said was a good way to put it. Um, it seemed to me that he might have taken it a little personally because it did seem that Schwartz was suggesting that maybe um, and endodontics was failing because the general dentist wasn't doing the proper restorative work. I don't know. I mean, it just might, might have been suggested. Well, let me give an example. So I've done endodontics for approaching 50 years and I, a lot of times back in the day, not for decades, but back in the day, it was normal to make it easy for general dentists to get back into the pulp chamber. They are the restorative dentists. Let me make this very clear. There's a wheel and the center of the wheel is the hub. The hub is the general dentist and the patient. The spokes on the wheel are kind of like the graphic, pedo, perio, pros, ortho, endo, um, and then of course the prayer. Uh, refer for prayer. Anyway, there's these spokes. The wheel rolls true and doesn't wobble because the trope, the spokes are all intact. So the general dentist, it's their call when they want to refer to these other disciplines. Our job out here around the wheel is to facilitate patient care, to help the general dentist, to make the patient get well, to help the general dentist have a wonderful fun time doing the rest of the job. So when I left cotton pellets in the pulp chamber and I saw the six month recall with a radial lucency below the crown, that was a representation of a cotton pellet that was left behind. That's nothing more than a big sponge or a wick and everything in life leaks. The coefficient expansion between buildups, metal cores, amalgams, gold, the, the casting itself, they're all different. So things move and they're moving on a microscopic, uh, micron level. So we're just trying to slow things down, disease from a gallop to a trot. And so if we see cotton pellets left behind and we know everything leaks a little bit, people drink cold fluids, they drink a hot coffee. Things are expanding and contracting. Movement, thousands of cycles, 1200 pounds per square inch, work balance, things move, they begin to leak. So back in the 70s, general dentists 
uh, like that convenience, but endodontists started knowing this trend. And because of that, there was a trend in endodontics to manage the pulp chamber. So now you're getting into a little issue because maybe the dentist wants to put a post, maybe the endodontist doesn't think it needs a post. That's where we need to communicate. So we always, when we started not leaving cotton behind, I would ask general dentists, do you want in that day, do you want cavit from the floor all the way up? And a lot of them didn't care, but they didn't want all the work of drilling out the cavit, so they still want that cotton pellet. And then we kind of got into conversations with the general dentist, well, what if we protected Ruddle's orifices and placed something sub-orifice level, one or two millimeters? So we would stub in that era a little bit of amalgam, one or two millimeters. I didn't say three or four. I said one or two below the orifice and bring the core all the way up the clusal surface. And that was considered a definitive repair. The assumption is the crown fits well. It's aesthetically pleasing. It has proper biological width. And there's a great soft tissue response to the margins of the crown if they're subgingival. And of course, super gingival would even be better. So... Uh, that was a, a little trend back in the 70s. Uh, I'm just, we'll get to the other stuff, but that was where we started taking more responsibility for the chamber because leakage is the fatal flaw in endodontics. And 100% of all failures are bacterial in etiology. So if we worry about leakage, uh, I've said this on other shows, Mahmoud Torbij had said that if you tag gutta percha or tag bacteria occlusally in a saliva environment, you can pick those bacteria up. I think he said 60 or 90 days because I get confused. Then the lady, Lisa Wilcox, also did a study, same thing, and one of them said 30 days, one said 90 days. I got the memo. The memo was gutta percha can be entombed in a root for the life of the patient. The key word is entombed and incarcerated. But if it's exposed to salivary leakage, it breaks down rapidly over the entire length of the shape. So that was a big wake-up call. Those were monumental studies that evolved uh, in the 70s and 80s. And all of a sudden, we started thinking, we got to manage leakage. And as my friend Denny Southern and endodontist in Tulsa, Oklahoma said, and manage the rest of the seal. So endodontists were really concerned and uh, really focused on sealing the root canal system. But then we saw little breakdowns in communication with the referral and then the middle was was it the cotton pellet still or was it some leaky restorer that's meant to be there for 30 60 90 days and now we're trying to get a lifetime out of it so endodontics begin taking more charge of the pulp chamber i didn't get to any other stuff yet but just the pulp chamber yeah i think also um richard schwartz was saying that um not putting a restoration on immediately also predisposes to fractures too. So that was an issue where he was saying you need to at least do something initial to get it going. Um, and I don't think actually Dr. Cassis had a problem with some initial restorative work. I think it was more that he felt maybe Richard Schwartz was suggesting more than just the initial. And, and, he, and he was. And maybe this is like somehow eroding the trust that exists between general dentists and endodontists. And I think that that's, kind of what the the main problem he thought was happening with the article. Um, then Dr. Al Gluskin, the president of the AAE, wrote a response letter um, and he was saying that Dr. Schwartz's article wasn't meant to be like an AAE policy statement, but rather just to you know spur discussion like what's happening with us right now. And um, I just wanted to read one little short paragraph that he wrote in his response, Dr. Gluskin. Mm -hmm. He wrote, the AGD letter goes to the heart of what referral relationships are all about. Who performs certain procedures is determined by consensus between the referring doctor and specialist with clear communication, which I've heard you say many times now, and mutual respect. Our common goal is to provide the best possible care for patients, putting patients first. As specialists, we also want to make life easier for the doctors who refer patients. So after reading that response, his response, it doesn't really seem like um, he is trying to say that endodontists should take up all the restorative work. He's just wanting to say, you know, there needs to be, I, the main thing there needs to be is communication. Well, I'll go one more scenario. This is normal. When general dentists uh, are in a more mature practice and they're busy. 
uh, emergencies are an intrusion into an otherwise busy scheduled day. So the problem is, is a general dentist sees a patient who was up last night and they immediately take a bite wing or something and they diagnose that it needs a root canal. It's going to really disrupt my day. Let's get them out of here, get them to ruddle. So that's going to be sent to me. When I see the patient, I'm just making this up. It's all cycle drama role play, but you're all dentists, so you can imagine. It could be a little bit of decay under the crown. It could be blowout decay. It could be submarginal decay, and it could be crestal to the crest of bone or subcrestal decay. That's in my office now as an emergency, and I've probably backed off a little bit on a regular scheduled patient to take care of this patient, but how do I do the palliative treatment with all this stuff going on. So I'm obligated to remove the casting if one's there because it's defective, clean out the decay. The general dentist could have done all this right. They could have said, well, hey, I'm gonna send you to Ronald, but first, let me invest about 40 minutes taking the crown off, clean out the decay, electrosurgery. So bring in the electrosurgery, use your laser, cauterize that tissue. Oh my God, it's clear to the crest of bone. Maybe I should do a little bone ramping. No, they wanted it out of their office. So in Richard Schwartz's uh, favor, he was a general dentist for 20 years. That doesn't make it good or bad. It just means he has experience doing this. The general dentist is entrusting me to take care of their patient, get them out of pain. So part of endodontic treatment is pre-treatment. And pre-treatment is caries control. What if the tooth's not even restorable? What if Ruddle keeps cleaning and grinding out all the caries, the soft dentin, and I feel like, you know, Short of a periodontal miracle, crown lengthening, we're gonna, I, this tooth's non-restorable. Well then why am I even doing palliative treatment? It should be extraction instead of the, so I think both sides in here, I think both sides were completely crazy because I think what Cassisa should have done, Bruce, you're my pal, I don't even know you. You should have called up Al Gluskin and you guys should have had a coffee, a coffee with Al, a coffee with Bruce. And they should have talked about this because I'm not looking. I have never met an endodontist that is a specialist who has isolated their treatment to this discipline. I want to do more restorative. Bring it on. I'm a little underbooked. I need more procedures to do. That's not how it works at all. We're there to do endodontics. And if we have to chase decay, then guess what? Ruddle's going to do a core buildup because I need to isolate the tooth. And how do I isolate a tooth that's subgingival? So, Bruce, I think you would agree with me. I don't think we even have any differences. If you refer me a patient, like I just described, I do caries control. I can't even clamp the damn thing. So yeah, I'm going to do a Toffelmeyer. I'm going to do a buildup with one of those bonding materials. In the old days, it was amalgam and then an ortho band, but I'm going to do all that. Then I'm going to make my access. Now I have total control. I can do world-class endodontics and I can refer back a case where all you got to do is land the margin. Sometimes, it came up in this article that I love, it came up that Schwartz said, well, you know what, sometimes those margins are sub-G and I have a microscope and I'll put the margin on for the colleague. I never met a general dentist that didn't say, thanks a lot. Rick, thanks a lot. Cliff, thanks a lot. Because we're making their life easier. And we're, we're, we're charging a small buildup fee, please. It's not about who gets paid because there were several inferences uh, getting out of your lane. Uh, you're looking to expand your income. Uh, you're taking away our work. There's no turf war. There's no turf war at all. It's, I, I never had in 45 years of practice, I never had one general dentist call me up and scold me for doing anything. Uh, well, as I got, they never even saw the endo. Half the time, they didn't even see the x-ray. They just said, thanks a lot. That was heroics. Thanks for putting that. But, geez, you even landed a margin for me. Yeah, just take an impression, pal. And off to the lab and get the casting, put it on, and everybody wins. Well, you know, I have to say I read the letters that you, because you gave me these letters. I read those two letters before I actually read Dr. Schwartz's article. And so after I read the letters, then I'm like, well, geez, what did he say in his article? So then I found the article and read the article. And I can actually kind of see both people's sides. I think the, the problem just kind of comes down to just the tone of the article. Honestly, 
it just, I can kind of understand why Dr. Cassis might have been a little offended. And I can also understand where Dr. Gluskin is coming in, saying that, you know what, we just all need to work together and be a team and communicate and have respect for each other. So, you know, I, I, I could kind of see both sides. Um, Maybe we should have Bruce on the show. Yeah, because I, I know Bruce. I mean, I don't know Bruce. I know Alan Gluskin. He was at University of Pacific when I was there. We both went to Endo. He was a general dentist, and I was a kid finishing up. We both went to Endo school more or less at the same exact period of time. And I know Rick. I referred family members in San Antonio to his office because we had a dark tooth in a family from trauma. And uh, although he didn't turn out to bleach it, he's a very ethical and honest guy. And he referred it on... Um, to a general dentist that he works with. So I think endodontists are here to please. I hate to say that. I mean, look, <laughs> available, affordable, and affordable, right? And we're there to please the patient, please the general dentist, and we're part of the team. And I, I really think that uh, what's missing here before this big statement where it really sounds like two big organizations, uh, one's about 60,000, one's about 8,000, are doing this, come on, guys. Pick up the phone and talk it through and then write a, write a nice article together about where the boundaries are, where the gray areas are, where's the commonality. And is it okay if we play in that area of commonality a little bit? And if not, we can always refer the patient back to you, Bruce, and you can do the clean out, you can do the electrosurgery, crown lengthening. And you know what? Most dentists would say to me, well, Cliff, if I'm going to do all that, I might as well do the root canal. <laughs> yeah, you might as well do the root canal. I actually think, okay, we have a graphic now to show you that answers our question, whose job is it? So why don't we see that graphic? Together, everyone achieves more. Teamwork. <laughs> so what is the whole preface, the whole foundation of interdisciplinary treatment? It's teamwork. Yeah, and I think you said it before. This was never an issue for you because there was always communication and mutual respect. And I think that you just need to be communicating with, if you're an endodontist, you need to be communicating with the general dentist and vice versa. Well, I said this to my daughter when we were planning this segment. And I mean, when it makes a magazine and you have two big organizations, uh, I tipped my hat to her and said, okay, we'll do it. My inside conversation was, why would we ever do a segment on this? This has never been a problem in 45 years. I don't even know that it's a problem for anybody, but it, apparently it was a problem, so we've talked about it. Okay, well, thank you for all the useful information and your insight. From now on, I'm, I'm gonna refer Carrie's control back to the general dentist, <laughs> if they promise not to do the MB1. So we're going to close our show today with another Ruddle flashback. So you ready? Ready. Okay, let's go back in time to 1976 Las Vegas. Why don't you tell us what happened there? I got it. I can remember. <laughs> yes, I remember perfectly. Gambling pays off. <laughs> um, well, I had just finished the program at Harvard School of Dental Medicine and graduated and we had taken the famous ride home that we will have to tell in another story that you remember. And uh, I got back in Santa Barbara, got my practice started, and it was like, uh, you know, time to go to the AAE meeting, the first one since I had graduated, and of course it was in Las Vegas. So in this particular instance, because you guys were young, Phyllis didn't come with me, so I went by myself. and. The first day was a glorious uh, gourmet meal of uh, mini speakers, you know, relevant topics, fun stuff. And um, that night I was with my pals and there was a few drinks and uh, nobody wanted to gamble, but I thought I should because I was there. And that's what you do in Vegas, right? You don't go to dental meetings in Vegas, you gamble in Vegas and what you do in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? <laughs> so anyway, um, I went to my room and got, I don't know, 10 bucks because we were on a shoestring having finished up Harvard and the University of Pacific in San Francisco. Uh, at that time, I think it was like the second or third most expensive school in the nation. So we were into a lot of debt and I went down there with a limited amount of money so Phyllis wouldn't beat the hell out of me later. And uh, well, I should tell this now, my uncle 
was a big gambler, and we shouldn't even go into his life. He was a troop gunner on a troop ship in World War II. He's a wild man, but he did love to gamble. And he said, whenever you gamble, Cliff, he thought I was a big gambler. It wasn't. He said, <laughs> always get the attention of a big crowd. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, choose a machine that is close to a line where people are going into a show because they'll start queuing up about a half hour early. And he said about 10 minutes before the show, there'll be hundreds of people ready to go in. So try to get a machine right by those people. So I waited for one to come clear and it was a bicentennial machine. Our country was founded in 1776 and this was 1976. And so it was a four line deal. You got to line up four things. And um, I uh, was pulling on the handle, putting in three quarters, pulling on the handle. And I was getting a few feeds, a little bit of trickling. So now I was playing with their money. My money was gone, but I had a little house money. And I put in four quarters, pulled the handle, and boom, one, seven, seven, six. The bells went off and everything. The people in the line went crazy. They started cheering. And all of a sudden, this little lady with a hat on, she's with the hotel, the casino, she came running up to me and whisked me away by my arm and, and right to this cashier area where they paid me $1,776 in cash. Well, I had not seen that kind of money in virtually all my life. So that, that was like, you know, uh, well, I was going to say you remember Dwayne, but we won't go into that story either. But I thought I'd probably become a billionaire. And so I immediately went to my room, but it was like one or something in the morning. And of course, there was a full program the next day. So all the endodontists were sleeping. So I went to knock on Mike Shenamble's door because I wanted to tell somebody the good news. And Mike, when he came to the door, I threw all the money at him and it went all over the bed and everywhere. And he said uh, some very tough words, but it was like, <laughs> get out of my room. I'm trying to sleep. Well, I was very happy still. I wasn't too discouraged. So I called Phyllis and, and you know, told her the good news and went to the rest of the show. So yeah, we lined up 1776. I remember mom telling us at home that, that you won money on a slot machine in Las Vegas and me and Lori were really excited. Do you remember what we used the money for? Tell me. We bought a hot tub. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So where we used to live in Santa Barbara, we had this really nice backyard. A little creek was running through. It was very idyllic, you know, and we had like a, a redwood deck. So, yeah, we put in a hot tub, didn't we? I do remember a future chore that was to come was draining the hot tub and cleaning it. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that's an example of uh, gambling pays off. I'm actually so you'll just hear it from me. I'm not a, a big gambler. I work too hard to gamble, but I always do like to play like, uh, you know, take 20 bucks down and see what happens. Okay. Now I wasn't going to say this, but you've actually won another time in Las Vegas about the same amount of money l at a later date. So what tips do you have for our viewers about how to win in Las Vegas? Heed the words of my uncle. I mean, they, they want you to see winning. They want everybody that's going to lose like their shorts. They want you to see winning does occur. So don't go to the back of a, a you know, deep bowels of a bunker in a hotel and, and find a corner that's quiet. Get out to where the traffic is. <laughs> so develop a strategy to win, kind of like an endodontics, right? <laughs> yeah, the endodontics, uh, if you are where I sit, I would say when some people perform it, it's a complete gamble. <laughs> So I hope they hit the slots and line them all up, you know. Shave clean pack and resto, R2C, restoration to crown. Pull that handle, win. Okay, well, thanks for sharing that story. I like it a lot. Thanks. See you next time on The Rebel Show. On New Year's Day, I would say there's a few more touristy type people out there. Here, all the fishermen are going out. Yeah, it was just one good tour. So. Well, Lisa, that was a phenomenal suggestion because Setting the show aside, that was a great way to start the day.